If you're applying to study maths at Oxford or Cambridge, or pretty much any STEM subject, in your interview you will have to sketch a graph. And these will not necessarily be super basic graphs like linear, quadratic, trig graphs. These are going to be perhaps composite functions where you take one function and you put it inside another function, or something like this where we've got a function multiplied by another function, so the product of two functions, or maybe you divide two functions and see what happens. But you will be expected to sketch graphs and you need to know the strategy to sketch them. And that's what I'm going to outline in this video with this specific example. So I'm going to try and show you how at me as an Oxford graduate, how I would have answered this in my interview, which is what got me my offer to study maths at the University of Oxford. As I say, my name is Jamie and I study maths at the University of Oxford. And now I help students all across the globe who want to get into studying maths or similar subjects get into Oxford or Cambridge. So of course, the interviews around the corner, this is definitely something that will come up, something to do with graph sketching. So I'm going to show you what you should be saying how you should be articulating your ideas and thoughts and how you should approach sketching this graph. Let's get stuck in. So I'm going to kind of role play and pretend I'm going to be the interviewee here. And I've just been asked to sketch this. OK, cool. So first thing I'm looking at when I notice this graph is I notice that it's not an odd or even function because ln of x is neither an odd nor an even function. In fact, ln of x is only defined for positive values of x. So the reason I was looking to see if it was odd or even is because then I could maybe use some symmetry to help me in terms of the sketch, but it doesn't have that, so never mind. Similarly, it's not periodic. Again, that would have been lovely if it was, if this was a periodic function, I could have only sketched it for a period and then copied and pasted it, but I guess that won't work here. And if I just think about the domain here, as I said, x has to be positive for this ln of x to be defined. And this x is defined for all real numbers x. So I guess the domain here would have to be x being bigger than zero. And I maybe ask that as a question to the interviewer. And then they say, yeah. And I say, okay, cool, amazing. And I guess the range here, well, I could try and work out the exact range, but I noticed that, for example, as x goes to infinity, x times ln of x, that will go to infinity. And for most values of x, both x and ln of x will be positive. The only difference is maybe when x is a small number and x is between 0 and 1, then ln of x will be negative. So for the time being, I'll just oh, sorry sketch out my axes. I don't need the negative part of the axes because, as I say, x is bigger than 0. And what I want to do is think about the intercepts of this graph. So where does this graph cross the x and y axes. Let's start with the y axis. Well, what happens when x equal, uh, to find the y intercept, I need to see what happens when x equals zero. Now, of course, x can't equal zero because we're just defining the domain to be x being bigger than zero. But what I could consider is the limit as x approaches zero. So the limit as x approaches zero of x ln x. Well, the issue here with this is, well, both x, or x approaches 0 as, LN, as, as x approaches 0. So you could argue that this whole thing approaches 0. But equally, you could say ln of x approaches negative infinity as x approaches 0. So you've got a weird 0 times infinity situation. Now, this is what we call indeterminate form. So I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule to help me evaluate this. So I'm going to write this in a bit of a weird way first. I'm going to write this as the limit as x approaches 0 of ln of x over 1 over x. And this, according to L'Hopital's rule, is going to be the limit as x approaches 0 of, if I take the derivative of the numerator, that's 1 over x, and the derivative of the denominator, that's negative 1 over x squared, I get this. And if I just simplify this limit, this is the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x. But of course, now this is much easier to evaluate. This is simply 0. And in fact, it's going to be 0 from the negative side. So it's going to approach 0 from underneath. So that means that as x approaches 0, x ln of x will approach 0. So my graph is going to, although it doesn't technically have a y-intercept of 0, it's going to approach the origin. And it's going to come in from underneath. Cool. Amazing. So that's the y-intercept. I'm also going to consider where the x-intercept of, uh, of this graph is, or it may have multiple. And in order to do that, I'm going to make y equal to 0. And in doing so, I get, if I just put this here, I get 0 equals x ln of x. And of course, since x is positive, we can ignore this guy, and we, or divide both sides by x, and we get ln of x is 0, which implies that x equals 1. 
So we know when x is 1, we're gonna, the graph's going to pass through the x-axis. And since earlier we mentioned that as x goes to infinity, y approaches infinity, I also know that the graph's going to kind of end up up here, so in the top right. So as x goes to infinity, y will also go to infinity. So eventually the graph's going to, to kind of go upwards in that direction. The question is, what happens in between? Now, what I suspect from the things that we've kind of observed so far is that this graph kind of maybe turns around here and then goes up like this, perhaps. But in theory, there's nothing stopping this graph doing something silly like this and wiggling about and then going up. So what I should consider next is maybe if this graph has any turning points. And I can do that by considering the derivative of this function. So y equals x ln of x, if I just differentiate this down here. So y equals x ln of x. So dy by dx, using the product rule, would equal ln of x plus x times 1 over x. And this obviously then just simplifies to ln of x plus 1. And in order to find the turning points of this, of this graph, should it have any, I'd set this equal to 0. And in solving this, I'm going to get x equals e to the power of minus 1, or 1 over e. And so that tells me that this graph should have a turning point or a stationary point when x equals 1 over e. Now, 1 over e, e is roughly 2.7, let's say roughly 3. So 1 over e will be roughly a third, so maybe there. And this kind of checks out. So our graph doesn't pass through that point, but it does have a turning point there. So what the sketch I had previously maybe could check out, where I have something like this. And we can kind of see it's going to have to be a minimum because we know the graph is down from zero and it has to eventually come back up to get one. And since everything's nice and continuous, it must turn about at one. And since there are no other turning points, the graph, and, and since the graph is continuous, for positive values of x, the graph will then have to just continue going up and up and up like so. And so this would be a sketch of our graph, y equals x ln x. Boom, end of scene. That is a really good response, if I do say so myself, to this problem. Why? I didn't just sketch a graph, I explained my thoughts and reasonings very well. So a couple of things in there which were really good and a couple of things in there which would have made me stand out compared to the other good applicants. So one of the big things being loppy towels rule. If you haven't heard of that before, learn it. It's it's so worth it. It's so it's not really that advanced, but it makes you sound really, really smart because it's I think it is ta taught in like FP2 or something, but realistically, you wouldn't have learned this in school by this point, I think. But it's a super useful tool if uh, you haven't learned it. So, if you've not heard of L'Hopital's rule, go and look it up. L'Hopital, like the French word for hospital, uh, his rule. Anyway, I'm not going to go into what that rule is or why it works, but it's something that is really useful. If you name drop it in an interview and use it correctly, they'll go, wow, this, this student not only does do they know the A-level maths and further maths, but they also have gone out of their way to learn more interesting skills and techniques. Boom, you're in their good books. But also, what else did I do well? Well, I didn't dive into sketching. I, I did some, oh, my camera's just gone away. Oh, I'll use my other camera. <laughs> Not sure what's happened there, but okay. Um, yeah, I didn't just go straight away into uh, solving this or, or sketching a graph or putting random points. And I made my thought process very clear. So at the start, I said I was considering whether it was an odd or an even function. And I explained why. I wasn't just saying, okay, let's see if this is odd. Okay, it's not odd. Never mind. I was saying why I was considering it as well. Why would that be useful for me? Because remember, the interviewer doesn't necessarily know your thoughts. In fact, that's the whole point of the interview. They want you to they want to understand your thoughts. And any thought you have as a mathematician should be backed up. Like, or any any reason to go and want to investigate something should be motivated. So I could have seen, you know, I could have taken the fifth derivative of this function, but what would be the point? There's no real benefit of that. But if I just started taking derivatives of this and the, in, didn't say to the interviewer why I was doing this, they'd probably be a bit confused. They'd be thinking, what, why is this student taking the derivative? So you want to make everything you do, you want to motivate it. So here, for example, before I took the derivative, I said, why? Why am I calculating dy dx? Well, because we expect there to be some turning points in this graph. And so by taking the derivative and setting that equal to zero, we'll be able to find the turning points. That way, A, I've said to the interviewer what I'm doing. And so they know what my upcoming bits of algebra are all about. But B, let's say I'm really pressed for time in the interview, or this is like the last question or something or whatever. They might not get you to do the algebra. They, might, they don't actually really care about you actually getting the algebra correct. They, they just want to see your thought process. They know you can do the algebra. Cool. So it was very, very 
clearly structured. I told the interviewer exactly the steps I was doing and made it clear why I was doing it as well. 